That was just a sample of the work of our next guest who helped co-write one of the most famous love songs in history, More Than Words. Guitarist Nuno Betancourt of the rock band Extreme has often been called the second coming of Eddie Van Halen since the band's debut 35 years ago. He's recorded with Janet Jackson and toured with Rihanna. Today, he's thrilling audiences around the world with Extreme's latest album, Six. It's been getting rave reviews and has led to sold out shows, including a packed house tonight at the House of Blues. I caught up with Nuno Betancourt. He spoke about growing up the youngest of 10 siblings, the early days of playing in the band, and his last encounter with his hero, Eddie Van Halen, shortly before he passed. To me, Nuno ought to be up there in the sort of gallery of the best, the most original, most inspiring. Nuno, you were born in Portugal and you immigrated to the United States, to Massachusetts as a young kid. You're the youngest of 10. So as the baby, did your family baby you or were you left to your own devices? Like there's a the kitchen if you're hungry. Of course they ba babied me. My mom did anyways. Everybody else beat on me, but my mom always looks after the baby. I was the youngest of 10, six boys, four girls. We were a very close musical family. So that's what, that's what ties together. Everybody played an instrument. Yeah, Everyone. you say musical family, and, and what's nice about that is that you weren't all just listening to different styles of music because you all had your own preferences, but you had the ability to make your own music. You refer to musical instruments in the house as being as common as a piece of furniture. That is correct. It, you know, I didn't know it. You know, when you grow up that way, you think it is normal, and every household has all that furniture. You know, a guitar in the corner, a little bit of a drum kit in the corner, uh, sort of acoustic piano, up, an upright somewhere, and. And we weren't even that well off, but you know what? I, I thought we were so rich because of all the music in the house and the instruments. And I felt like, man, I'd go over to my friend's house and it was so not that. It was so very quiet and very, just very proper. And we were just like wild, man, like jamming and singing and playing Beatles stuff. Was, I, 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 very lucky growing up in, in, uh, in the Betancourt household. Yeah, I wish I lived down the street from you because it was a big production. We went to the music store to buy my flute and piccolo, and, and that was it. Um, uh, <laughs> but, I always wondered why my friends always wanted to be at my house. I didn't know. I didn't absolutely. Know that, that was probably a big part of it. Your first love was drums, but you later fell in love with the guitar. And you know, one of the things you can do with guitar is write your own melodies. You're kind of like your, your one man show. But you saw Eddie Van Halen, Ka Katie Bar the Door, at that moment is when you really fell in love with the guitar. My brother Louis, Louis Betancourt was my first guitar hero. He was, he was and still is an incredible guitarist. I think I stole everything initially from him, even to the point when, when people see us jam together, everybody gives me that side eye going, oh, so you stole everything from your brother. But obviously falling in love with Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and, and all sorts of bands and guitar players, but it was definitely when Edward Van Halen and Van Halen came out in 78 that it was like, uh oh, what sorcery is this? He changed the whole game, you know, he changed everything as we knew it. You know? Yeah, yeah. You would stare at like guitar heroes on magazines and hope that maybe one day I could be that. I mean, you had a vision board before vision boards were cool. Fortunately and unfortunately, school kind of went out the window a little bit for anybody that's in school. Stay in school, do your thing, do it all, because you can do both. But for me, I was, it was an obsession to learn drums, to play bass, to do guitar, some keyboards, and I would pretend I'd walk to school and I'd go back and go into my basement and just play all day. <laughs> so nobody knew I was there. And you went through the journey because you had your garage bands, you were in the basements, like you said, but you learned the recording part, the producing part. Uh, you were in a band with your brothers, the Viking, then the Dream. The Dream soon became Extreme and joining the band Extreme. So at this point, you're at the next level. It's interesting when you look back, even even when you're at a band like Extreme and you do have, finally get a record contract and you're touring, you start touring clubs and you even after you have the success, you kind of look back to all the things that all the bands that you just mentioned, which was Viking, like you said, and, and Myth, my first band and, and Sinful. You look back at those days as probably some of the most important and most fun days of your career. Because yeah, the success is where it kind of defines you and the hits you may have. But man, you would almost give anything to go back in a way because it was the most innocent and the most productive and, and the most important in the shaping of you as, as, a, as an artist, as a, as a player, as a band member. It's everything that you learn. It's that university you go through. So you kind of miss it.
Yeah. Yeah. When you say that shaping of, because I would imagine one of the struggles is is trying not to sound like someone else. I mean, you loved Queen, the Queen, an amazing band. So many other great bands out there at the time, and so you have to kind of morph into finding what defines you. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's one of those things where. Uh, my heroes that I mentioned, Edward Van Halen and Brian May and Queen and Joe Perry and Aerosmith, you always have this thing that you kind of, you are what you eat. And somehow you hope that you don't, you're not trying to, to whatever comes out of you, you don't sit there and go, oh, I want to write a Queen song or I want to write a Van Halen song or an Aerosmith song. What you're doing is your own thing. But of course, in that fiber, you know, that DNA, you're going to hear hints of Edward and hints of Joe Perry and hints of those bands. And I think those bands had those hits as well you know like when when zeppelin came out and that delta blues that influenced them and everything else from from the deep south they were there we just we just heard it as Led Zeppelin, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know what's so cool about you is because you have this history, you have a collection of things, and we can dive into any uh, part of your career and find something really cool and really different. Your second album, Pornography, <laughs> which yeah. we love that title. When people will come in, they go, yeah, well, you know, we, we really would like to get his single, More Than Words, and they go, okay, here it is right here. Oh, no, honey, I'm not buying that. Oh, no, put that back, right? They, people sometimes yeah. didn't realize that, that that was on that album, but uh, when you, when you had something more than words, it was different from what you had been doing in, in a more quiet space. Then you couldn't make things new. Absolutely right. But what's interesting about that, it within the scheme of the album, and extreme albums, you know, hence the name extreme, it's always one to the other, right? And but I think people were confused at first because the bands that we grew up on, even even Queen or even Led Zeppelin, had beautiful acoustic stuff. You know, Aerosmith had Dream On. They had always had these beautiful piano, acoustic driven stuff. But we also grew up on bands like, you know, James Taylor and, and Bread, bands out of the 70s that played these beautiful acoustic numbers that we always loved as well. Everly Brothers, Beatles, you know. People, people thought they, they, they brought, when they got the album, they thought they took the wrong album home. They return, a lot of people were returning the album. They didn't know it was the right band. <laughs> you could do so much of both. I mean, you could strip it down to that really beautiful acoustic sound, but then you could get up on the stage and lose your mind. I think whatever we do on stage, and if anybody has seen the band live, and I always talk about this, I think an artist, for us, when I go on stage, is kind of like you black out a bit. You know, you're so all in that you're not really, the show's over like that because you, you let yourself go, you get lost in the music, whether it is get the funk out of it. Whether it is more than words. More than words to show you feel that your love for me is real. The wholehearted. You don't really sit there and go like I have a favorite. Everything you, you pour yourself into every song. You have multi generational groups now who listen to your music. What is it like for you to look out in the audience and see a, a, a young person, mom and daddy, and grandpa and grandma out there as well, all singing to your tunes? That is pretty incredible. We're going nearly 40 years. And, and the funny thing is, is that lately with this new album, which was really a surprise at the response and the love for it, we're, you know, we've been so blessed with what's happening with the album six, is I always ask after we play the first of five songs, I always, whether we were just in the UK, in Europe, Australia, Japan, and I always say, how many people here are seeing Extreme for the first time? And I get really surprised because I see so many younger people in the audience as well. And, and it's always somewhere between 40 to 60% of people are all newer fans just off this album. It's super exciting. Like you said, we see parents with their kids, but we also see people discovering the new album just because of the way music gets discovered now, you know, online. Yeah, you know, there was a moment there where, where rock music changed or the style changed. You know, you had the grunge and the whole bit that came in and you all kind of weren't selling the kind of numbers of records as you had done before, but you brought it all back together. You had your new recording. Eddie Van Halen, who you who was your hero, who you got to meet, at one point said, I, I can't wait to hear what you're working on. And you said, well, eh, wait, let me wait till I get it all all put together. Yeah, it was really interesting because I've only, you know, as being probably my biggest hero, Edward, I've, I've gotten to share a room with him maybe 10 or 12 times throughout the tour, maybe at his house in the studio here and there on a social level. And and uh, this time around, he surprised me at my house 
he was hanging with Gary, our singer, for lunch, and they surprised me. They called me to come down, and I was recording the, the Soul of the Rise, which is the first single we had. And he really wanted to come up in here, and you know, me being the Virgo that I am, I wanted to make sure it was done right and proper, because it's Edward, you want to get it right. And unfortunately, he didn't get to come back. I didn't, we didn't realize that he was as sick as he was. And, and uh, but it was really a bit of a blessing to have him show up while we're doing this new album, specifically that solo and that song on that day. And you know, it was just it was it was it was so it's a strange goodbye, you know, in, in a little weird way, you know. And, and nobody's ever gonna nobody nobody's ever gonna take the throne, Edward Van Halen throne. But I'm hoping that he's smiling down, you know, after that day and just saying, hey, you know what, you done you done good, kid. Keep it up. Keep keep that torch going and rock and roll and, and guitar playing. You know? You are keeping it up. I know you have to get going, but I want to end with this. Uh, you know, you, you broke apart for a while. In fact, one of your band members was like running an alpaca farm. <laughs> and then you've come back together in your maturity in looking back at your history. What is different about being on stage today than it may have been in those early days? It's a great question, you know, because I think you would never want to trade your your virgin years, if you will. You know, like you, you never equipped for success in, in playing, you know, sold out shows and having hits and things like that there's no class in school not that i showed up but there was no class in school to teach you that or even or even even on a local level you know there was no club was going to teach you what was to come and you would never you'll never forget those days but i think playing now and going up now and i think the appreciation and even you know me at 57 and gary in 60 in his early 60s and us all in our 50s we have such a blessed life and such a uh, it's such a blessing to have the fans that we have still come and see the band and we still get to do what we love to do for a living and that alone and and, and the relationship we have with our fans and, and and the passion that they have and that we have i wish there was a word to describe we're just so blessed you know it's so it's just incredible and i think we we appreciate it more now because it's we don't take it for granted you know? yeah thanks for blessing us with great music and can't wait to see you at the house of blues Thank you so much. We hope to see you there soon. We're so excited. Take care. I'll be the crazy girl screaming in the front row. Extreme will perform live in Houston on their Thicker Than Blood tour tonight at 7 p.m. at the House of Blues with special guest Living Color. Limited tickets remain for this thrilling evening of guitar-driven rock and roll. For more information on Extreme's new album, Six, or to purchase tickets to tonight's concert, visit GreatDayHouston.com.